So um, without further ado, let me introduce Ang Lee. So um, I want to start, I'm going to be calling um, him Ang for purposes of this uh, discussion. Um, and I just want to start out by um, perhaps um, if you could share your journey um, in your career, uh, just some background for everyone. Uh, I, I was born and brought up in Taiwan until I was 23 after my military service, uh, college military service. Um, I was in theater um, in the Academy of Art in Taiwan because I failed the college examinations. Um, <laughs> I was too nervous. I was like freaked out in math. Uh, till these days, I still have bad dreams about taking math exams. Me too. Um, <laughs> And you grow up, you know, how Asian boys are. Um, and my, the, to make things worse, my father was the uh, principal of my high school, which is the best high school in Taiwan. So that actually did it for me. Uh, it's the root of my world class director, I think. Uh, like Hitchcock, he get locked up in the police of you know, uh, a dark room, and then he go out and scare the hell out of everybody for the rest of his life. Uh, anyway, that's kind of my background. I come here being a foreigner. Uh, I really want to be an actor. Um, and I was in the uh, University of Illinois theater department. I couldn't speak English. I couldn't act. I had to direct. I was very depressed. <laughs> uh, I couldn't get over the language barrier. Um, to be honest, when I directed Sense Sensibility, uh, I was speaking pidgin English, which is so encouraging. If I speak that kind of English, direct Jane Austen with Emma Thompson, uh, I can do anything with the films. Uh, anyway, um, I, I learned a lot about Western drama, uh, a lot of things. That those two years in Illinois was really influential to me. That really laid the background of what I did today, which is Western drama, how we study uh, human behavior, how we put dramatic elements together and clash and examine humanity. Uh, that's really my root of what I do. Even I go more and more visualized because I'm doing movie, it's sight and sound. But my root is really the five years, three years in Taiwan, two years in Illinois. Uh, and then I, I feel like a failed actor, I had to direct. Uh, and I felt nobody cared for theater directors. This really for actors, so I shift to film. And I went to NYU Film School. Uh, I believe some of you are, right? <laughs> it's very different. I was a year behind Spike Lee. I worked in his film, that sort of thing. Uh, it was uh, at uh, near 2nd Avenue, um, 7th Street. Uh, it was this small joint thing. Uh, it's nothing like what you have today. Uh, we have to rent most of the equipment from outside, actually, uh, certainly editing. Anyway, I think I found what I, my, my niche uh, at, at film school, because we just went out there and make movies. And it was so easy for me. Uh, there's no language barrier. I, was, I think I could tell a story visually. Uh, that came pretty easily. And I just noticed that even I didn't really speak English, uh, people listened to me. Um, so in terms of in internship, I would intern and start from the morning. I rarely do that. I'm a bad example for internship. Um, I'm good at giving orders. I'm terribly taking orders. <laughs> and the way I was brought up, you, you keep tolerating and take order until one day you give order. So that's how I was brought up. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit of struggle after film school, but at a few times, uh, having a job, I realized in movies, starting from film school, uh, like I would start in the morning and in the afternoon, everybody, including the director, would listen to me. Um, it's just that just, I was born to do this. And finally, I get to make um, Pushing Hands, my first movie, uh, getting the government funding. I won a war in script writing, and they gave me money to make my first movie. And then that was a hit in Taiwan. That was some 25, 26 years ago now. Um, and the second was a wedding banquet. And one thing leads to the next. After three movies, after you 
your favorite <laughs> drink man woman, I got English job. Um, that's sense and sensibility. And then, well, I hope I don't take an hour to explain myself. <laughs> Uh, each, um, I think after Sense Sensibility, um, I, I want to learn. I'm an avid filmmaker, I realized. Uh, I would like my career to be a very long film school. I love learning about how movies are done. And I realized after Sense and Sensibility, which I'm doing a movie of the same vibe, three in Chinese, one in English, uh, and a major league, when people came up to me and say, I love sensibility, I just feel like I want to punch them. <laughs> I was so irritated. And I realized I, I need to learn, I need to change. I cannot pigeonhole to a certain vibe, certain type of filmmaking, and certain way of communicating myself to the audience. Uh, so I really make effort, and I start with uh, another movie, The Ice Storm, which even family drama has a very different tone than before. Then I really start uh, this journey of keep dis deconstructing what I did and try to find new things so I can feel I'm alive, I'm fresh. Uh, now I'm facing new challenges. So every movie has to have some kind of uh, impossible elements in it or elements that are impossible to put together. Gay, cowboy, uh, uh, or something quite impossible. Or like Life of Pi. Um, the artistic side and the commercial side, the, the philosophical requirement of the material and how you deliver storytelling, something that's enigmatic and that need new technology, needs new language, uh, or new ways of looking at film, or even a different, different genre or combination of genres that will make me want to go at it. But that, that's uh, a brief of my, myself. I'm still in that journey. I'm 61. Um, I, I want to feel like you guys. Like, hmm, what do I do next? <laughs> how can I learn? Um, how can I be intern while somebody's paying? Um, <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> I think what's really fascinating for me is that um, the idea of learning and deconstructing what is, some may feel, a very classic way to do things. And um, you're, you challenge yourself in trying to reinvent and create new combinations. Where do you get your inspiration from? Um, I would like to say, honestly, nobody. Uh, I can say hundreds of them, um, like Kubrick, for one, Stanley Kubrick, for one. Uh, for now, no. Uh, my heroes keep shifting <laughs> from years to years. Um, but I don't think that's what he does. I, I think people have tendency to do that. They don't ask those questions. Uh, they don't look for inspiration. They just couldn't stop it. They couldn't be beat up. Um, many times, uh, uh, by the way, this is not arrogance or anything, or it's just cracking jokes. When young people ask me, or people ask me, what's your advice for young aspiring filmmakers? I say, don't do it. I dare you to do it. <laughs> but over the years, my peers, I see them. Uh, even NYU film, best, uh, film School, and maybe get one every year, get to make movies. Uh, a lot of them just drift away, and everybody suffers. Uh, so it's very tough. Even a successful one, they have their problems. I have my problems. <laughs> um, so if you like security, don't do it. And, and, and I, I notice people who cannot discourage, they are the ones who eventually do it. So I, I don't think to me that's a question or, or who inspired me. Right now, Scorsese inspired me. He's a lot older than I am. It went way longer. He knows so much more. And I just I introduced him. He, he had a dream to make this meditative movie called Silence. He could never down it, get the movie. Somehow he down it. He could not do it in Japan. I say, you try Taiwan. It's cheaper there. It's beautiful. He just made the movie there. I think he doesn't know how to sell it. And he, the old man's still doing that. That's my inspiration. Because it shifts. It's not Kubrick anymore. <laughs> this year will be Scorsese. 
Um, so there's always uh, inspiration. Um, I think it's valuable if we can inspire others. Because uh, you want to try something, uh, you cannot stop that, and you you want to fulfill that uh, that need, that urge. You you have to do try something, and and you want to share. I think that's very important. Honestly, share to other people. I think honestly, that's all there is. Uh, you want to share that experience, that pulse. Yeah, you find a way to make it to be seen. I think when you um, actually doing it, it becomes something else. It was never how you imagined, and you know, it was work out as planned. It. It's a journey, and that's my life. You know, I chose to live that life. Um, and everybody has their life, their inspirations. You don't have to make movies. You don't have to direct. You don't have to this or that. But uh, I think everybody will find their ways. They're equally uh, satisfying and fulfilling. A lot of the terms that you're using um, thus far are really about um, are very emotion-filled, very much about passion and honesty and telling your story. Um, and I think that's really inspiring for people who, as you mentioned, the film industry is not an easy industry to be in, but it takes up that kind of energy to really be passionate and sometimes climb an uphill battle um, to do. And I think your story, um, talking about even your journey in coming to the United States and having language barriers, but still wanting to be challenged by it, and finding a way to express yourself through um, through film is just a fantastic story because the challenges you think in life are sometimes you know some that you can easily overcome and some that you just have to redirect and find uh, the right channel for. So I think hopefully for everyone that's pretty inspiring. One of the interesting things that I learned um, before this uh, session was that uh, you're not based in California. And so where you have an industry that's very West Coast based, um, you know, why are you here on the East Coast? Um, I like New York. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'm cynical or not cynical towards LA. Um, I feel like New York, I just made a movie about war, the Iraqi war. Uh, right now I will say, if, in filmmaking, I feel like I'm in the trenches, and LA feel like Washington to me. Um, I, I don't really talk that language. But in the beginning, after school, that's not my choice. This is the only place I know that I make movie. I went to NYU. Um, my wife works, uh, so she followed me to here. This is the only place I know where movie might happen. Uh, once we move here, which is January 86, after she get her doctoral degree, um, we move out here in two months. Uh, after we move here with the baby, uh, I went to LA to try out to, to push my, my script. And I realized all the jobs are there. It was already kind of too late. Um, now over the years, I struggled in the city. I raised children here in the suburb. Uh, I feel downtown around NYU area anywhere from Chinatown to about 14th Street. That, that's my turf, my place I know. Uh, I love to make movies in New York, all the angles, starting from stu uh, student days. I like a lot of secret angles. Maybe not so much this, these days. Back in the 70s and 80s, and it's like a treasure island to me, just visually. And I like its clothes. You know, it's walkable. You're not driving. You're associated with all kinds of people. I like the subway. They stink, but <laughs> I see all kinds of interesting things. Uh, most of all, you, I see all kinds of people. Uh, these days, if I go to LA, everybody talk movie. They have a project. They're kind of unreal. Uh, I feel like, you know, my feet was three feet above ground. I, I didn't feel I was landed. I just like this city, and I know everything. This feels like the, the heart, the center of the universe to me. Um, I just like it here. I was very lucky I get to develop here. Uh, I, at least I would do post here. I start on making a movie here, and then I do all the post here. Um, this is my home. 
as a native New Yorker, I personally know that feeling. Um, home is really um, a great center for you to then um, be part of uh, a bigger community, and it's a great place for inspiration, I think. And um, I'm sure those of you who are NYU the students- The energy is very old. young, always young to me. Yeah. Um, fresh, I like it. That's great. And do you think that impacts your filmmaking? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I say you cannot, you can leave the boy out of Chinatown, you cannot leave China out of the boy. I would say that about New York. I go anywhere and make a movie that's like bigger than Hollywood size, but I still feel like uh, there's a certain New York in me. Um, one of the things um, that I found also very interesting is that you're um, going to be coming out with a new film. And in this um, new film, you've incorporated new technology in your filmmaking. Can you describe for everyone um, sort of what you've done differently for your new film? Um, you look pretty young, I will say. I, 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 I think this is your thing. I'm <laughs> just trying to pave the way. <laughs> I think movie needs to change. It hasn't changed from my student days. Uh, you can watch them on, on Samsung. I think we always need that temple. We don't go to temple or mosque or church that much anymore. I think we need to go to movie theater. In a dark house, we share the experience watching something fantastic. Like when I was a kid. The movie's not like that anymore. So I, I think uh, we're in the digital world, and we still think like movie. We can see dimension now because of the digital uh, media, but we still think like 2D, like film. We try to imitate the past, not even as good. So the whole thing, once I get touched, my first, I, I was a diehard film guy. I'm an on the border of film preservation and you know, all that. And I resist even DI till very lately. Uh, until Life of Pi, that changed um, because I want to see another dimension that needs to uh, be done digitally. That's my first digital, only my last movie. Uh, I got into digital filmmaking and then things just don't, it's very strange, uh, I noticed. It's, it's, it doesn't take a very good filmmaker, any filmmaker can see uh, things don't add up <laughs> or onto something new. So I think what I try, I, I, but you know, uh, I, I, that's a very difficult movie to make. So I need to survive that movie. Uh, fortunately, I survived that movie. It did pretty well, actually. Uh, that was fortunate. So I guess it's, it's, uh, from this movie on, uh, I think I want to move on to the next stage of filmmaking, which is digital filmmaking. Uh, the, the new movie I do is a stroke, a movie is called Flix. It was always like this. 24 frames per second is the minimum to carry, the cheapest. This is a cheap exact decision, because, not because there's any good, um, to carry soundtrack. Once the soundtrack, uh, sound movie happened, uh, movies move up from 18 to 24. That's the minimum. So it's called flick. It, it always, you deal with strobes. If not strobe, it's blur. Shadow angled and all that. That's film. I think digitally we can do faster. Uh, when you move up to around about 100, uh, stroke left you. When you dimensionalize it, uh, it's very much like what your eyes see. A movie is something else. The way you engage there is different. Uh, I don't want to say this in public. <laughs> I see a camera there. Uh, this is a funny thought hit me. You see the, <laughs> this is the, you see the movie Pineapple Express? I have that cross thing. I say, this will be the part your grandchildren will be smoking. <laughs> I feel like I was trying to figure that out for you guys. <laughs> this will be the movie you'll be smoking next. <laughs> um, well, anyway, I think my relationship with the movie should change, but it's a big jump, because uh, that's all we know. A flat, we create dimension inside of it with flex, you deal with that, the compensation becomes art itself. It's a sophisticated, great form of art, precious to me. The, I love it more than I love life. Yeah.
I'm a filmmaker, like many of you. Uh, but I think uh, in order to go to the new tempo, to drag us over to that, to, to not watch it on Samsung, uh, I think that's, I would like to think something more fantastical, um, like go there and engage in that world, in that movie world, is this new thing. We can take steps. Um, the transition commercial uh, application is difficult, but it's challenging. Um, but I, I like to make it uh, as an experiment, uh, see how that works. Uh, it's very tough filmmaking because most of what I know doesn't really apply. You don't even know you don't know uh, things. Why would we make movie this way, that way? Because that's a compensation for certain media. Now you're doing different media. Um, I often think that since I did Pi, it's very unfair when people compare 3D with 2D because 2D is a very sophisticated art medium. You now, over 100 years, numerous filmmakers, and then we watched them. It's matured a long time ago, and 3D is baby. We haven't even started yet. They're bad. There's no good <laughs> 3D. It's not even watchable, in my opinion. No, we just try to grasp it, and we don't even know it's different from 2D. Because we make 3D movie or digital movie, as I said before, uh, imitating the past. It, it doesn't quite add up to me. So I'm in that process. Uh, I'm like a baby, uh, an old baby, that is. <laughs> um, I'm working with and also uh, uh, struggling with the system because it's a it's an ecosystem existing is ecosystem concept culture um, the commerciality the industry uh, even the equipment you have the knowledge you have is is, is just in the beginning um, but it's fascinating it's, it's fascinating I, I, it reminds me of when I was in film school I tried to figure something out like well movies first thing I learned is faster than life. If you shoot like how your eyes see, it's way too slow. The video goes so fast. And then when you put the camera here, you're inside of a relationship instead of like live, we're outside of a relationship, of somebody's relationship. Those things in film school that really excites me. Uh, now at 61, after 25 years professional uh, filmmaking, I can still get excited because I don't know. I, I like to go where I'm, I don't know, I'm curious. Um, I see how, how long that can go, I can still do that. <laughs> I think the great thing is just um, reinventing a category, reinventing a genre. The idea of, uh, we don't know what the future holds, but you know, the idea of leading it and trying to discover it, I think um, that continuous learning is a great part for careers and just um, part of that discovery phase is the excitement that comes along with it as well. So, um, you know, it's really exciting. You know, you're, you're a very laid back guy, but you can hear the passion in your voice about that, that idea of, you know, just reinventing. Um, one of the interesting things coming out of this new film is the idea of going back to the movie theater. Can you share your thoughts on that? And I know that you're a big advocate of of this idea of the big screen. Um, I think for everyone, we'd be interested to know your perspective and why that's so important. It's very hard to say. Um, there's a real life. If you're Buddhist, you know that's a reflection of the truth, which is hiding in the negative space of nothingness. Sometimes what is obvious as reality might not be the truth. The truth might be the opposite something unknown. Um, our imagination, for example. You know, we get older, you get older, you'll be like me, and so on and so forth. We change. We lost our innocence, and life moves on. Um, everything will change. You think you can believe this, then one day you realize you cannot believe it. Things change on you. That's the only unchange. Uh, facts in life. It's always, you can count on this, things always change. But our imagination, our artistic creation seems to last longer. Something you create, Star Wars, you know, those, you know Dark Vader, they always like that. <laughs> it has an absolute value in it, in art, 
in our creation, in our imagination. And we even want to share that in a dark room. So something about that is precious that capture our innocence. So we keep wanting to go back to the same place. But in order to be the same, you have to change. I, I think I want to change movie and, and the media because I want to go to the same place. When I was young, when the curtain went up, when I hear that flick, I got excited. When I see the logo, what is universal? I got excited. I don't get excited. I watch them like, oh, whatever. Uh, again, I want to watch on Samsung. Uh, when I watch the logo, I'm not ex I'm sorry to keep Samsung. <laughs> That's the uh, I'm sure Samsung invents something really big and fancy someday. <laughs> now, often I, I create, I think, reinvent or something like uh, Crouching Tiger and Dragon, for instance. And people particularly here, outside of Asia, which they're like, uh, the way I did the genre actually violate genre. The genre is, is, is B-movie, it's supposedly crappy, that's why people fly and do this and that, it's highly designed. It's your hidden pleasure, your guilty pleasure. <laughs> that's the hidden dragon. <laughs> uh, and then I did it in a way that you actually have a lot of accuracy and I, in short, an A-grade B-genre. People look, look at it very strange, but here, it really take off outside of Asia because it brought back the innocence. I probably tell you the oldest story, but because there's a new look, there's a change to it, because it's Chinese, they're in custom, they fly, they do this and that, but they forget about things they, they got cynical about, like who's gonna watch musical and believe that somebody feel like in Star House singing? It's a lot, lot harder than the 60s, 50s. Uh, so, by changing it, you actually you go back to when people remember their innocence when they're young, when they go to the theater. They got very excited watching Crouch and Tiger and Dragon coming over here. That's an example. I think we must because our life changed, our technology changed, our perception changed. And when we get used to something, we start to get tired of it, we get cynical about it, we see what it is. So you need the next movie tricks, next thing to stimulate you to go back something you need to go to, which is your, your innocence. Uh, and again, again, I will say in a dark room, somehow it has to be a, a big dark room with the illumination, with, uh, with the reflection. Uh, it's like our mirror, but that mirror is not showing who we are, but what our mind is. No, not how we look, but how we hit ourselves. In life, I think we're, it mostly lies. We chose. We have to be civilized. We have to get along with people. Uh, we have to restrain. But in movie, we gotta e e excel. You know, we gotta we gotta fly. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's movie for me. And I think it always once in a while you need to upgrade it to come up with new tricks to go to the same place. I think that is to me. That's fulfillment. But for me, as a filmmaker, there's another thing. I never buy it like when people are taking learning as a process so you can get to a goal. You learn this, you intern so you can get a job. You learn filmmaking so you can make movies, so you have a goal at the end. I don't think so. I think the learning itself is a goal. Sometimes, so often, I feel life doesn't have meaning. It's absurd. You know, no theory and no effort can find an answer to it. It's an ongoing thing, it's very complicated, it's absurd, it's God's job, it's not our job. You cannot understand, you can observe it, but you cannot really understand it. Um, so learning, adapting itself is kind of the purpose of life, to me. That's my, my feeling about life, you know, uh, just me. Uh, I think learning itself is what kept me alive and seems to be the purpose. And now that I have a goal, I work so hard, I make this new media, I make this movie so I can get success, so I can get recognition, so people can say, yeah. 
when the movie is gone, I, I don't really want to watch them. <laughs> uh, when I promote a movie, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, to promote a Chinese movie to the whole world, it took me 13 months. It was exactly one year to the Oscar day, and I have the good uh, victory tour in Asia for another month, still sitting in the movie. It's 13 months. That feels like work to me. But making movie, figure something out, learning something was never a goal to me. Uh, that was my life. Um, so uh, that's my two cents. I, I, I like learning. Sometimes I get very tired. <laughs> but uh, I think it, it is indeed the purpose of life. I think that's really um, a great insight. Um, sometimes we are so goal-driven and oriented that we sometimes lose the perspective to look up and just appreciate the process and um, just that that learning part of it. And I just like doing it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and um, you know, we were talking beforehand, and um, coming from an Asian American family, sometimes it's very very goal oriented, and um, you know, and we were also talking about generational shifts in general, um, and just the the journey and appreciating that journey. And thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, and even you know, it's it's very. Uh, so fascinating to me to to know that you know that that experience really makes you a bit disinterested even to watch the movie after because you're enveloped by what that experience was in the way as well. So I think that's um, it's so important for us to sometimes look up and remember to appreciate um, what what it took uh, sometimes um, to get to the goal as much as the, you know the goal itself. Um, what I'd like to do now is. Um, actually transition a bit. Um, what we did prior to today's session was to ask some film students to submit some some of their films. Um, and so Director Lee will, ha uh, will uh, critique and provide his perspective on one. So we have one filmmaker with us today. Um, his name is Ian Barling. He's an MFA candidate in film at NYU and a transplant from the West Coast. Um, he received his undergraduate degree from UCSB in film and media studies and philosophy. You studied a lot. Um, now, um, I'm going to ask um, Ian to just share a little bit about his film, Unfounded. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you. Yeah, NYU. Why you? Why you? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really excited to start this, this upcoming year. Uh, so the, the film's called Unfounded. Um, the total running time is around 16 minutes. It's basically about a relationship between a mother and a daughter. Um, it takes place during a time when the daughter is going away to college, um, and this going away has a, has a great effect on the mother, who has a past history of, um, she, she has a lot of problems associated with her mental state and her past. And so the mother going away kind of, or the, the daughter going away kind of brings up some of these problems again. Um, and it's not easy for the daughter to, to go away either. That they, They've been getting to know each other and have developed some of a relationship, a different type of relationship as the daughter gets older. Uh, the, the first 30 seconds of the film is the, thir is the 30 seconds I'm gonna show and it's just kind of an introduction to the, to the, to the mother, who's actually my mom in real life. Um, uh -huh. Thank you. Thanks. Great, can we show the film? Comment? Yeah, just sure. That's my, not my forte. But, um, it just reminds me of a line in, um, in Amadeus. Any one of you seen it? When Sadier said, too many notes. <laughs> if you're Mozart, I think there are many, many shots. And something very simple, 
I think that's your, your style. If I were to do the same thing, it might be two shots. But I found that every shot, every little moment, every object, every look, even two looks, you have one shot to express that thing. That's your style. And it was very smoothly put together. Uh, so detail is very important for you. And that certainly expressed um, many, many shots. But every, every shot of them, there's a certain um, observation and expression in there. It was very accurately captured, it's peculiar faces. Um, I wonder if uh, at this rate would you have fewer shots, more continuity, or that's just your style, but I think it's very genuine, very expressive. Congratulations. Like, <laughs> like <it. laughs> I hope you heard that Mozart I had many notes. <laughs> So um, what we'd like to do now, Aang, is um, open it up to the audience for some questions um, that um, I'm sure that um, have come up prior, maybe you thought of before coming here or during this conversation that you'd like to ask um, Director Lee. So we're going to start with one from the very front. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I'm a college student at the University of Pennsylvania. And so my question is, what has been the most challenging part of your professional career, and how did you persevere? Um, many, many. I try to single out one out of uh, hundreds of the challenges. Um, in the early years, I, I think, um, moving into doing things professionally, try to get in, and then try to do it in a major, major league fashion. That, that's, that's pretty difficult, especially when I had to do it in English, the second language. Not only a language barrier, just things you know, the familiarity of the material. Um, but but that, that's technical. I think the, the challenge is a movie takes a lot of resources to do professional movies. Um, we live in a world with gravities. There's reality. So sometimes you, you don't really get what you want and you're, you're struggling, to, uh, struggling with reality. You try to assert your opinion, but then there's a certain ways, habits, how people watch movies as a group, how industry make them, how your crew under, try to understand you. And and you want to stay earnest, I think that's the hardest part. Do I have to fake it? Do I have to compromise? <laughs> Do I have to make it so obvious to so many people? Uh, even our films, your crew has to somewhat understand so they can carry on. Uh, I think that's, that's probably the, the number one, I, th I think. Uh, it's not always what you think, you have to deal with people. You can't kill them, you cannot live with them. <laughs> but you need them, you need the support. Uh, and you, you need them to watch it. Uh, but you have something that's very hard. If this movie is, is not uh, really uh, verbalizable, like, uh, it cannot really verbalize it. When you talk about it, Put in second language, like even in Chinese for me. When you talk about it, you rationalize it. When you face studio, they say, but we respect you. Just tell us, just explain to us. I don't get it. Then you're already at a lose. When you explain to them, you lose. When you argue, when you rationalize it, when you read a piece of uh, a review, you're already losing what's originally in your mind because you rationalize it with people. I think that's the putting all technical sides, money, this and that aside. I think people come to me usually with good intention, even with studios, and they want to do something, you know, because that's why we make movies. But in the process of a communication, you feel you're losing it, and you get agitated, and, and you become kind of a monster. Even nice guys like me will get agitated. Uh, I think that's, that's enigmatic. Uh, there's no solution. Hopefully, in the process, you find your way to communicate. You're still satisfied, and better yet, you get to the next level.
because the difficulty you realize something else uh, in life, in filmmaking, in the media, uh, that's the best scenario. And sometimes you just get beat, you just have to compromise. Uh, that's movie. And the movie making as a whole, the experience is, is my life, but to watch the movie and say that's what I was thinking, <laughs> not quite. But people would take off and that's at the end of Life of Pi, that's not a line, not in the book, that's my line, my heart. The story's yours now, like whatever. <laughs> uh, when Pi, the older Pi tell the story and the writer said, can I write it? You know, you say, what are you talking about? I told you the story, it's yours now. Uh, what are you, whatever, you take over. I think at the end of the day, you can never make a movie as good as how people imagine. So it's, it's their, uh, we're vehicles. We, we just make that media and people take away whatever they want to take and take off. Um, but that's a little abstract, but that, that's, that's something about, that I struggle the most other than daily life, how to make the movie, how to deal with the studio. Thank you. Um, are you guys yep. passing the mic? Is, how would you want to do it? Would you like just to pick someone and ask a question? That'd be great. Is that me? Me? All right, cool. Hey, um, my name is uh, Bradley. I, I'm an MFA uh, thesis student at NYU Grad Film. So with your theater background, can you talk about how you, I guess, work with actors? Do you rehearse a lot? Are you giving them a lot of flexibility on set? Um, sort of that process. Uh, maybe talk about casting as well. I guess it, it depends on the actor, per se, in the project, but. Casting, people say, is half of the job. Um, I think, actually, and some producer will even say casting is everything. We cast the right person, the movie take off, you rest the movie on them. I, I think it's half of the job. Uh, no more than half, certainly no more than half. The other, you make the movie look like they're, pa they're perfectly casted. It's a lot of work. Uh, I think the actors need to come to the movie and you need to go to the actors. Uh, there are th things you just obviously know. There's no way that person can be how you imagine. And then the face and what they do has a chemistry with cinema and, and you just have to respect that. There's nothing you can control. You have to learn and take cue from there. So it's really a, a chemistry. I, I came from theatrical background, but I cannot say all, I know all the method acting as good as actors themselves or acting coach. I'm not a, that degree, but my strength is see how camera pick them up. The, you know, now I have new camera, new vision, how that work with a face. Uh, so that's very important. Usually we watch from the monitor. Uh, you cannot trust your eyes anymore because eventually what it shows is, is the end result. You have to see the end result on uh, the screen. Uh, end, end result, uh, that you have to, that humbles you. Eventually that's what it is. You have to look at that and forget about all your thoughts, eventually put aside your thoughts, your um, method or their method. So I think it's a collaboration. Uh, some actors, particularly movie stars, have certain ways of doing things. You cannot, if you cannot bend them, you work. You have to work along with them or work against it. Uh, like Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven, he come up. He's a movie star. My first experience with um, movie star was um, um, Sense Sensibility. Before that, I just used them as actors. When movie star come in, I like to use them as movie star. I didn't realize movie star do certain things actors cannot do. It's like a contract with the audience. They came with certain things, certain chemistry. You have to respect that. Uh, like Clint Eastwood, for example, in um, Unforgiven, uh, he's using that movie to work against what he's about, about a hero movie. No, you cannot have an actor do that. It takes Clean Wood to do that role, and he reversed that role. That's the movie. So you have to know your thing. I think that's important. So as a filmmaker, I think you need to do two things. One is uh, the regular theater actor things. I think it's a good thing that you know a piece of heart. You know, 
you just want to, you don't want to just fit in as a moving prop and they do their thing. Actor do their thing, director do their thing. I don't think that it's good. I think you have to relate to each other. Acting is to react. You know, at that same thing with directing. I think directing, sometimes you give direction, you also react to what you're having. And then feedback. I think it's a give and take relationship. So rehearsing is not so much, it's not like a theatrical rehearse. You rehearse them for two, three months, and then they carry the whole play on stage. It's not like that. We do moments, shots by shots, all those sequences, months at a time. You had to pace them, you had to capture them, and all that. So director is very much like a coach, like a basketball coach. And when the camera rolling, that's when play starts. You don't want to waste time in rehearsal or practice. The game itself, is shooting, is the real thing. You have to be prepared so you can drop all the preparation and spontaneously react to what's happening on set. When you're shooting, it's hundreds of days preparation, hundreds of elements, hundreds of people, they all drop everything prepared to that moment. It's precious. I get really angry people don't pay attention. I can nice guy can scream at people if they don't pay attention or have an attitude. Because how dare you to do all these people work so hard to get this moment and make it look good. So people are all focus on that one spot. It's precious. You don't let us slip away. If you don't insist, things will slip away. So actors crew, everybody must pay attention. This is a pressure, this is a holy time. It's our temple, it's our altar. You must pay attention. You have to give 200%. It's the real thing, it's happening when the camera's rolling. So everything is about prepare to that moment, but when that moment happens, you have to trust the movie God. You have to let things happen. Same thing with, uh, with actors. This is the idea. Some movie stars come over here, they don't care, no, that kills it, you endure, it sucks, shit, whatever, too bad. But if you have any control, you should fight for those precious moments, make it as ideal, as possible, as, for me. Their directors, their shooting is their practice. I cannot do that, just the type of movie I do, they're expensive. So I will do as much preparation, rehearsal, uh, even starting from casting, the first time I meet the person, I let him know who's driving, and you know, there's a certain vibe you have to, the way you start building relationship, even your casting. Then once you start, it's, it's about they understand you, you understand them. We, you rehearse just to, uh, I'm talking about my styles. It's not about rehearse so you know what to do, but you have some understanding, feeling of each other and the material because they become reality. They're, they become what you're looking at, not the pages, <laughs> words on the pages. They become real. It's in the process. And then as a director, it's not just one actor. They all come from different background. They have a different vibe, different method, different average. You know, it's, everybody is like a mountain you have to climb through. Then you have to put them together so they're in one movie with your vision, with your other elements, the art department, this, that, you know, a whole lot of things. You, you blend them together so they're coherent. They have a narrative arc. They have a focus. They have a theme. They have to serve that one movie purpose. So I think as a filmmaker, you, you have the you're inheriting the optimistic, uh, um, the everywhere, often presence, often presence kind of a position. Actors has to respect that. And you have to respect actors because they think nothing but themselves, that part. They teach you so much. A good actors, I would change the line for them because certain things, they, it's not like they don't try. They try their best. It's something they don't, and they function that way. They stay in character. If that doesn't work, you have to respect that. You have to change. With, in Chinese, we say, if the mountain don't turn, you make the road turn. <laughs> you still want to make that work for that person because you already casted them. You're already in the process of filmmaking. I think all that's very, I think a mutual respect is important. I would like to take the um, director. So I would like to people to believe that um, I'm in the driver's seat because I have all the information in my head. But I will respect every department because when they're thinking about it all the time. 
they bring the life, the reality of that character or that aspect of filmmaking. Uh, there's no definite answer. I think good preparation, knowledge, and then humble. You, you have to keep flexible, um, elastic. Uh, don't break. Don't you know, try to feel alive. I think it's an organic approach to things. You're most likely to succeed or find a life for the film when you allow yourself, you allow everybody to. I think it's, our, our job as a director is really provide a, a ground and discipline um, to allow some life to happen. Because everybody comes from different angles and you allow that life. Uh, sometimes discipline is important and you have to be not only authoritative, but that happened naturally because you do know the answer they don't know. Uh, you're like the, the bank of a river. If the river water wants to flow, it needs a bank. Otherwise, flood, it's no good. Oh, that's great. Um, next question, maybe from. It's a long answer, I'm sorry. No. I can talk three days, but yeah. Yep, we have one from the other <laughs> side of the room. Hi, my name is Sean. I'm a college student at NYU. Uh, the Academy Awards and the film industry in general is oftentimes criticized for being intensely white um, and patriarchal. As an aspiring artist, how can I work to push underrepresented stories and faces to the forefront of the industry? Uh, make good movies. <laughs> uh, I, I often said this to Asian. Um, community, because I'm Asian, a lot of time they ask me uh, questions, particularly young filmmakers or actors. Um, see, I, I never give that much thoughts. I just try to do my best. Uh, and then somehow it happened for me. So I think um, the first step, uh, uh, take Asian for example, we're the minority of minority here. Uh, not so much in Asia, <laughs> but in America it is. Like uh, uh, blacks and, and African American and, and la Latino population, they are a market. We're not a market. And in Asia, Asian Americans are still small too, so we are minorities uh, kind of anywhere. So how do you do that? I, I would suggest um, we need to create our own material. Uh, even my son, he wants to be an actor. I say, if you want a good part in America, you have to write it. Just, <laughs> even you're not a good writer, but you have to write it. That's how I started it. Create your own material, uh, or the material you care for to break that barrier. Because if you just rely on it, even politically correct, even you get a part, an actor for example, they're functional. They don't really have a soul or emotion like a real person. You have to come up with material first. Writing, that's uh, no matter you're a good writer or not, you create your material starting from writing and exercise uh, material. Because writing don't cost you anything. If you make a movie, you get a lot of money. If you fail, that's a big blow. But if you fail in words, you know, just try again. It costs you nothing. So uh, practice writing, create material, and pitch it until it's irresistible. Irresistible not meaning uh, I, I, that people try to grab people to understand me, but what can I share that, that enrich their lives? I think for, as I just tell us, the Asian kids, because most of them talk about accepting me. <laughs> I'm growing up because, uh, Sometimes nine out of ten short films about that, about accepting me. So what do you give the audience? They come in, they want to see themselves. What do you offer your experience that inspire them, that entertain them? What do you have to share? What do you have to give to this world? If you're thinking that way, I think there will be audience. Things will change. Um, in short, I think creating material and do your thing and find your stage little by little um, that, that's my way of dealing with it. I think political struggling, you know, have a voice is very important too. I myself am not particularly good at that, but I will encourage people, myself as well, just 
create material that uh, everybody can take a piece of it, can benefit from it, sharing. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kelsey. I'm a recent college graduate. Um, what is the best piece of advice that you've had during your career? Huh? Uh, what, oh, sorry, what's the best piece of advice you've received during your career? <laughs> when I was young, I, I don't really take advice anymore. <laughs> if I get advice, I tend to fight them. <laughs> when I was young, I remember this. This is on top of my head. Uh, when I pitched the movie, don't use the word sad. Uh, they don't like it. Just. <laughs> And I found out, this is my advice to you, use profoundly moving instead. Don't call it sad. <laughs> this lady, I, I keep seeing you raising your hand, and you don't get it. Oh, sorry. let's do one more. I want to say thank you so much for Brokeback Mountain, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. So you got it right there. Um, and it's exactly how we could have imagined it. Uh, I heard a rumor that you do not storyboard. So I'm wondering that process, like how do you work with your DP and et cetera with no storyboards? Okay. Uh, thank um, I stopped uh, believing storyboards since my NYU second film. We, we did five short films to get graduated. And I'm not a bad drawer, so uh, my first movie, I, I, I draw uh, pretty uh, diligently and faithfully to what I think the movie ought to be. And I think during my second short film, it just hit me, why do we... Um, w w why do we um, make movie to still photo, M make motion picture fitting to the still photo? Uh, that. That's very strange to me, and I stopped doing it until uh, Incense Sensibility is a major league job. There's a few sequences that was required. It's my job to draw it. Uh, so I have a storyboard artist game, because it's just, you know, so people can see it, and you can do it professionally. People can prepare the scenes, because a lot of prop and stuff, setting and, and stuff. Then I did it, but I didn't follow it. And then movie after movie, I will do it. They will come in. I found in American story barters is uh, really f filmmakers want to be. They made the movie already for you. And they're always th three times more shots than you, 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 intend, you end up to be. Because they, they cut it already. They moments, and visually they're astonishing. It looks very good on page. But there are too many in a studio where you ask, you know, we cannot afford this much. And you cut down, you cut down like a third of it. And that really troubles me. But when I shoot, I, I don't follow it. You know, I have my, because as filmmaker, you think about coverages, there's a continuity. So there comes many movies, I don't do them. Uh, or just do them, the faking it. I, I just do it as a job. Like uh, in Rival the Devil, this movie, I have to, Burn a whole town I built. <laughs> I spent eight weeks to, to build. Now, where do you put a real fire? Where do you burn? Where you put a smoke, a fake fire? You know, it's very complicated. People do need storyboard. So I would do it, but when I shoot it, I, I don't follow it. I, again, that's a preparation, and then I drop it. As I said, same thing with with, with actors. You, you prepare it to like really prepare and you just forget about it and, and see how you can do it because you're in a movie making land. Uh, to me, we have a saying in Chinese, you don't cut your feet to fit the shoes. You know, there's a story, but we have to do that. And <laughs> you're doing a movie. That, the whole thing don't mo make sense. Uh, I'm just telling you a brief story of my relationship with storyboard. I do them, but I don't follow them. Uh, because I'm a professional. Uh, then they come. <laughs> but then comes Hulk. It's really expensive, if, you know, and you actually have to follow them. Because uh, some shots cost 
$350,000. You have to draw and then draw it and discuss it in endless meetings before you even go at it. So it's so expensive that I had to uh, comply again. I actually had to follow him. At that time, people introduced me to previous, um, but nobody except David Fincher did it. But he's kind of a person, he wants the movie look like how it was previous. If it doesn't look like the previous, he get very upset. I know he's the only one, and then I know in uh, VI Spielberg did that Sin Town or whatever. But that's like a virtual set. It's like virtual reality set. You can go wander in there. Uh, I didn't see any previous. It's just like a set that you can, it was a virtual set. And then I went about it. I did previous, so it's moving. I'm dramatically trained, so visually previous something and fitting into, it's hard for me. I'm like bending backwards. Um, but I did try because it's so expensive. Physically, I have a lot of responsibilities. A shot can take six months, nine months, you know. It, um, and I started doing previous, so it's moving storyboards. Um, and then one day I realized they're showing me how to correct that movement while I was shooting it already. It took that long, that's not gonna work. <laughs> the previous is supposed you pre-visit, discuss, and they shoot it. I'm already shooting, they're only in the next second stage or still try to make a war. So back then, that was 2001. I think previous is, is, uh, uh, is not so easy. It's very, very slow. Uh, so slow that it's not usable. Uh, and then it comes Pi. Actually, I spent a year pre it. For the drifting, which is the biggest part of the movie, I actually did an animation movie before I even get greenlit. Uh, I, that's a big effort. So that's a new experience for me. It was very slow, but I went through that. I pre half of it before I get greenlit. So I did previous. Some of the previous is not doable because it's the water is actually very difficult. I have to change it. I found that very uh, interesting. By that, I I didn't really do drawing. Drawing for smaller scenes, uh, for the drifting part. Uh, actually, you can spend up to a million to previous. It take a year, uh, 70 minutes worth of previous. That's a moving storyboard. So we go at it, no, no drawing. Uh, the way to do it is very complicated. I describe it in my head. and do, Actually, I cannot previous in real life. I cannot uh, rehearse the actor and see how to capture them or scout the location, see where I want to see. I can tell the story. I can't. It's, it's, it's a boat on the ocean. <laughs> There's no way I can practice that or find an angle. So actually, that, I found that it's a interesting tool because itself is moving image. But it doesn't have the spontaneousness. It requires a visualized person more so than I do. There are people, they just see things. I'm not quite like that. I try, I poke actors certain ways or watch the scenery, something realistic and take it from there and then go to the abstract. To me, uh, previous storyboard is abstract. That, that's my story, and I have to see it happen and, and have a continuity as coverage, and then I put them together on the editing table. That's my process. But that is in the process of changing. This new movie, previous is a little faster, so I actually previous uh, quite a bit. And to prepare it, because it's the difficulty of even staging the simplest shots, Every shot in the movie, I previewed by shooting. You know, I shot 3D, two cameras. But every shot I did in the movie, I did, I shot it at least once with one camera and discussed it, put it together. So that's a big previous pro, uh, it's way beyond um, the storyboarding. Uh, in the following movie, I think there'll be better tools than more like camera. So it's, it's like shooting. And then you collect information. Uh, I think we're moving into digital world. The the idea of storyboard is, I always have conflict. Yes, you need that to 
to cope with your, your, your crew, to cooperate with the money people, studio who put up, <laughs> who take the physical responsibility, you, you are too. But I don't believe movie making that way. I think the new tools, digital movies, help you to, uh, like you guys, you probably pick up camera when you're little. For my generation, we got a 16 millimeter, that's privilege. We're rich kids in film school. <laughs> Otherwise, you have to intern to see if, how movies were made and try to learn from it. But we got film school with a 16 millimeter. Now anybody can pick up Samsung again and make movies. <laughs> Uh, so things are changing. We're in a digital world. Uh, I think what you call storyboarding is probably going to be more and more like a rehearsal. Like, a, like um, it's even go beyond previous. It's like a camera rehearsal. So we can cut down the prices. You don't use the most expensive part in filmmaking is shooting days. They're very expensive. So you cut down the prices and see what it is. Maybe that's the way to do. Uh, I think that's a long answer to storyboard. But I think that's a story of storyboard. <laughs> yeah, was, well, um, you know, I, I um, on behalf of everyone, just want to thank you so much for being here with us for this session. And it's so, um, it's so insightful um, to sort of see, and you describe the vision and just the effort that it takes to see a movie. We're we're privileged to see the final product, which is you, you know months and months in the making with a huge crew and just seeing your 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 commitment to um, bringing stories to life um, in film and having us envelop them and. You know, this was a little bit of an insight into all the effort and commitment that it takes and the responsibility you have as a filmmaker and director. So um, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for coming and sharing that insight. Thank you. And so uh, what I'd like to do is um, encourage everyone to come um, next week. Um, we're continuing the series next Wednesday. We will have Billy Bush, who is now part of the Today Show, um, here next week. So we hope you can come. And thank you for being with us today. Thanks.